So I suppose I can now say with great pleasure and very honored stage, welcome to you all. My name is Heinz Soss. I'm a member of the organization committee for this conference. And I hear some other noises, sorry. And I'm a member of the advisory board. Um, it's good afternoon to all European participants. It's good evening to those from Australia and a very good, pretty early morning to participants from the USA. I in particular like to welcome Betsy uh, Peabody, our keynote of today at the West Coast. We do not start with Betsy as keynote uh, because it would be very early day for her. A warm welcome to, to the participants of the student session who had a special meeting this morning already. Um, for obvious reasons, we need to organize this conference online again, like in November 2020, that was NORA 3. And uh, by September last, we thought it would become viable to organize uh, this event as an in-person event, but the COVID situation has become so alarming again that an online meeting is just a must. Special thanks to all who answer to the participation inquiry we organized in September. The result made clear that an in-person conference would be a real no-go. And this saved all involved with organizing, who are involved with organizing this event from many sleepless nights. Because if we would have had to change a few weeks before, that would have been chaos. Still, we had to move quickly to get everything arranged online, but here we are. Um, in principle, we still want to hold the NORA 5 conference as an in-person event, probably in November 2022 in Middelburg in the Netherlands. Um, it's already agreed with the partners and the venue, but we will decide in due course whether it's viable and we'll let you know. Um, now, I will show some information about who are behind all, all this as organizers and some information who are virtually here with us. Yes, indeed. So the organizing committee and the secretariat, Felines van Ermgassen, Katrin Wolnigurke, Boz Hancock, uh, they, those, this trio is really the engine of the conference, I should state. Um, without them, it would be impossible. Of course, I'm involved, Karen van der Leijheid is involved. The website for the communication, Andreas, as in that, and, uh, and technical support by uh, uh, Maximilian Krause. Uh, there's a scientific committee who selected all the presentations and the, uh, and the posters, and who also are the moderators uh, uh, for, for, the, for the conference, and the advisory board, uh, sometimes doubling with the scientific committee or the organizing committee, um, uh, who have give general guidance to uh, how we develop as NORA and also for this conference. So that's the full team, but as I said again, the real engine are the first three. Next one, please. Yes. In no, last year, we had 190 participants from 20 countries. And uh, the size of the dot shows, the, the red dots in this case, show the number of participants. And now I move to the next one for today's registration. That is 240, an amazing 247 participants from 18 countries. As you see, there are less people from uh, um, uh, outside Europe, probably people from, from, from China and other uh, locations uh, uh, just uh, had a, uh, wanted to, to, to sniff the atmosphere, so to say. And, uh, Probably we will work with them in the future again. Some countries I have uh, uh, split out on this uh, in this map, particularly Italy and, and France and Spain, to show, and that is, I think, great news, that there is suddenly much more interest um, from people working with native oysters in the Mediterranean. I think that is a fantastic addition. Well, Welcome to you all from these beautiful countries and these beautiful parts of Europe. Um, we really hope that native oyster restoration in, um, uh, in Italy 
in southern France, in Spain, in Croatia, Greece, um, yeah. well, in Greece. Um, and very nice also from a representation from Romania. There are also major voices in the Black Sea area, probably in need for restoration. Another statistics, next one, please. Um, made a split out from, of, of sectors, uh, the change between NORA 3 and NORA 4. Um, as you see, uh, the, rep the relative representation from, from science has decreased a little bit, uh, but from non-governmental organizations, mainly nature, uh, restoration, uh, nature protection uh, organizations, and from the fisheries and aquaculture sectors have really increased. The, the, the relative percentages you have to realize are uh, relative for NORA 4 to a larger amount of um, registrations. So the amount of uh, interest from the fisheries and aquaculture sector has more than doubled and from the NGO sector has almost doubled. I think that's very good news. It's less good news, I think, that governmental organizations still do not show that much interest in our work, maybe because we're still too scientific, that may be a reason, but we really need to increase increase the contact with them to make sure that they actively protect even more, protect native oyster restoration locations and natural reefs, and that they uh, maybe also help us more financially. Next one, please. Well, after NORA 3, we uh, organized an inquiry and the, the, the overall feedback was very positive. But there were some uh, proposed improvements. Please be less fast based. We didn't have time to digest uh, what was presented and more engagement and interaction. So for NORA 4, we did the following. Next one. We have longer breaks. As you have all noticed and have been able to exercise with it, we have an interactive program superimposed on the Zoom uh, through gather time. Um, I think it's fantastic. I love it. I hope everybody is able to work with it and, 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 and to meet people in one-to-one -one or in small groups. Um, and um, the other uh, uh, interactivity is we will organize two sessions with the advisory board about the future of NORA. That's going to happen tomorrow and days after tomorrow. We maintained the closed captioning. Um, I hope it's visible for all of you now. Uh, that means subtitling in English. For, all, for many non-native English speakers, that is a real um, benefit. Um, we also, because we would we spread out the meeting longer, we, we, we kept to the original program of two days in total spread over three days. So that keeps people also more, that gives also more opportunity to breathe. We all, as I said before, we had to be very quickly in, in, in setting up uh, all this for an online meeting, for an online NORA 4. And of course, these, this, the software we're using uh, costs money. And we also found very quickly financial support from the Rich North Sea program, for which we're very grateful. Thank you very much. Have a fantastic conference. Well, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Here we go. This is um, the start of our first technical session for Nora 4. And it's brilliant seeing so many people here interested to hear our papers and work. Um, so in this session, we'll be hearing from four speakers and they, they will be presenting their findings from their pilot restoration projects. And this is particularly exciting because we've been following the progress of these projects over the last five or so years. Certainly their projects have matured as Nora has matured itself. Um, first of all, we're gonna hear the talks and then there will be time for questions and answers at the end. So. I think we're asking everyone to turn the video off now and then when the questions and answers come on we'll invite you to turn them back on again. So first up we have uh, Dr. Stefan Poivot. Um, Stefan will be talking us through his 
talk, The Flat Oyster Restoration in France, 10 Years of Research and Future Perspectives. Um, Dr. Poirot is a marine biologist and scientific diver working at Inframer near Brest in France. And his current research is focused on the ecology and ecophysiology of temperate marine bivalves, especially the flat oyster, the Pacific oyster, and also pectinids, black and great scallops. Most of his projects is connected with conservation, restoration, agriculture, and fisheries. And I also know that a lot of the beautiful photographs we see are taken by Stefan. Thank you very much, Stefan. Over to you. Many thanks, um, Alison. So I will share my screen. <laughs> This one, okay. And normally you should you should have the good one. Uh, yes, is it okay for you? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, um, dear colleagues, I'm very pleased to be here to be in Gaza City with you. Weather is beautiful, and I hope the food will be excellent tonight at the dinner. And of course, I would like to thank all the NORA committee uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to uh, speak about uh, my, uh, my presentation. And uh, so uh, during 10 minutes, I will show you, um, sorry, just, I will show you uh, the main result concerning, um, uh, um, sorry, the problem with my computer. Yeah, I think it's better, yes, now. So during 10 minutes, I will show you an overview of the recent results we obtain, but also what we plan to do in the coming year. Sorry. Okay. And uh, so as a first slide to remind us uh, quickly the background, um, as elsewhere in Europe, uh, the fat oyster is really in decline in France. It has been completely overfished for centuries. In the previous century, the species was also cultivated for nearly 100 years, but two parasitic diseases uh, appeared in the 70s, and the production, as you can see on this graph, uh, has sharply decreased to zero. If we do nothing, the fat oyster will disappear in France uh, in, in the next few decades, as we can easily imagine when we look at this graph. So I really, really think that the time for restoration has come in France now. Um, in this table, I have made a review of the main publications and reports uh, we have produced in France over the last 40 years. Uh, you can see that there, is, there has been a major effort on zootechnics, on pathology, on genetics, and a fewer publications on physiology and ecology. But in the last few years, we can see more and more works on ecology and especially uh, the emergence of works dealing with the ecology of restoration. So I will now focus on those works and they are main results. I, I, have, um, I, have, I, I did a, a brief summary of this result. Uh, just for information, if you are interested in all this paper, not that these publications are available uh, through this link mentioned here. So first of all, uh, good news. Uh, the flat oyster is still present in France, of course, and in the wild, from Corsica to Normandy. And we have a more detailed observation in Brittany, thanks to, a project, thanks to the Forever project. But if the species is still present, it is important to point out that the population observed in France are really in poor condition. We have therefore proposed a scale to describe and classify the states um, of those population. The scale count five stage, um, the scale um, from a, sorry, from a critical, uh, critical stage to a functional one. <clears throat> and as you can see on the map, um, most population observed in Brittany uh, are more or less in a residual or fragile stage. But remember one thing, the species is still there and is able to reproduce at field naturally at many places. And this is really important for restoration action as you will see later. Thanks to all this field observation we made, we can say that the suitable environment for the well-being of the flat oyster is now clearly known. On this graph, uh, 
uh, we, we compared the, the ecological niche in green of uh, Ostrea edulis to those of uh, Crassostrea gigas uh, in blue. And uh, I will not go into the detail, but as you can see, the tolerance range um, to many environmental parameters is lower for Ostrea edulis in comparison with Crassostrea gigas. And the main things um, to retain, in my opinion, concern its crucial need for substrates. As you can see here, uh, to create its habitat, uh, the species absolutely needs substrates. For me, it is a main observation we did in France. Uh, it needs substrates for its fixation, for its protection, for its growth, for its survival. And as you can see on this picture taken in Brittany, uh, Fat Oyster can settle, of course, on a rock and stone. Um, but she prefer, it prefers uh, to fix on other shells, especially flat oyster shell or Pacific oyster shell. Of course, if, uh, there, um, if there is no uh, more natural substrate in the environment, the flat oyster is also able to settle uh, on artificial material, metal, concrete, or plastic. We have also worked on disease of the fat oyster, and of course, both parasitic disease due to Bonamia and Martelia are still there in France, but not everywhere and not every time. I give you some details about their respective occurrence in Brittany. Uh, Bonamia is uh, represented in velvet color and Martelia in pink color. And uh, as you can see, the, we, we found occurrence of both parasites in South Brittany but uh, in, and it was less, it was, there was less occurrence in the north of Brittany, but it depends on the season, of course. We have also worked on the ecology of those parasites, especially during the PhD of Nicolas Meru. And we have, uh, for example, shown that Martelia um, can be observed very often uh, outside the oster and especially in the sediment. The sediment can constitute a reserve pool, in fact. And I think that this may be really this result may be um, very interesting in terms of restoration. I cannot go into the detail in this work, but do not hesitate to ask us for the PhD of Nicola. Parasites can cause mortalities, but predators uh, plays also a key role on the dynamic of the current population. In some places, we think that predators are the major um, cause of no recovery. Of the species among predators, sea breams and uh, oyster driller uh, are presumably the most dangerous. And we had conducted specific experiment to evaluate more precisely uh, the predation. Uh, here you can see the cumulative mortality um, in two experimental populations set up on the seabed in Bay of Brest and in Bay of Quiberon. And the mortality due to oyster driller is in green, and mortality due to uh, seabream in blue. But you can see that in, that in less than three months, uh, predators uh, just destroyed totally, completely both experimental population we set up. On the basis of all the previous results, it appears now clearly for us that restoration in France must be applied differently according to the ecological condition of each residual population. Of course, when populations are in good condition, but this case is really, really uh, rare in France, passive restoration and adequate local policy are sufficient in this case. At the opposite, uh, when population is a recruitment limited, local reintroduction needs to be conducted by settings path as elsewhere from wide origin or from hatchery origin. But in fact, in many places in Britain, and I suppose in France also, we will see that in the future, but in many places, population is mainly limited by substrate. In this case, active restoration can potentially give good result, as I will now give you a free, uh, very concrete example uh, that we obtain in active restoration. So the example, um, at the present time, we have tested three active restoration techniques, shell deposition, shell concrete reef made with Pacific oyster 
shell and concrete. And uh, uh, also um, we have tested a metallic frame reef. And so you, um, uh, in each case, uh, sorry, the natural settlement was really good because we know where we can put it and when, when and where uh, we can put this, uh, this substrate uh, according to the laval peak and the laval abundance. So um, the settlement was really good. And after two or three years, um, the, the growth of oyster and the biodiversity was really significant. I will show you some video, but each method uh, have advantages and limits. Shell deposition is a cheap and easy technique that allows to restore large cover. But where we tested it, we observed a very fast burying that caused a slow growth of oyster. Deploying three-dimensional structure, shell concrete or metallic frame reef is more expensive, of, of, of course, but it gives um, um, a reef with a high relief, uh, with a very stable and resilient. And it work, uh, And if we work on the footprint and the design of this structure, I think we'll, it will constitute a very efficient method to restore flat oyster in France. So, just uh, two rapid uh, video uh, concerning the restoration uh, pilot, uh, and I, and you will see in the upper panel uh, the result for shell concrete, uh, and in the lower panel a uh, result for the metallic frame reef um, that we. We, call it, we implement that field. Uh, reef you will see uh, are now three years old. Uh, so you have several generations of oyster and some of them which now more than seven centimeters. You will see that there is a grid biodiversity with tunicate, ashidian, and also you will see the black scallop uh, species, which is very important in breast. Uh, I let you enjoy the dive and I let you also imagine, imagine how these results are stimulating for us. So the first one, shell concrete reef and metallic frame reef. Oh, sorry, not again. So to conclude my talk, I want to give you the potential roadmap for restoring uh, flat oyster in France in the coming year. In fact, in, I see uh, several roads, uh, several paths to open. Road one, uh, we must to continue to work on the substrate to find the most suitable one in terms of composition, biodegradability, design, acceptability, and so on. Um, we will have to initiate and assist mid-scale restoration with several partners and stakeholders at several places in France. It will take time, but I think it is really important. Um, we will have to continue to work, of course, on restoration ecology of the spaces, but also on the ecology of its parasites. And the last word, it will be also time to initiate the socioeconomic approach of flat oyster restoration and develop it as a true nature-based solution. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will be pleased to answer to your question at the end of the session, or of course, during uh, the meeting in Gaza City. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Stefan. Those images are in, at the end are really quite inspiring and very beautiful. So thank you very much for that. We look forward to receiving questions at, at the end. So now we're going to move on to our next presenter, um, Emily Reichlin. Emily will be talking about native oyster reefs in the Dutch North Sea, how much has, progress has been made in the five years since recovery. Uh, a biography of Emily. Emily is a senior marine advisor at WWF in the Netherlands. She has played a leading role amongst other projects, native oyster restoration in the Dutch Borkum Reef grounds. Unfortunately, Emily is unfor unable to be with here, uh, get this, it's because she's snorkeling with orcas up in Norway. Now, I'm not sure that's particularly fair. Anyway, we've got um, 
we have a pre-recorded um, presentation, so we look forward to hearing that and seeing that now. Hi, everybody. My name is Emilie Reuglin, and I would love to present to you on behalf of Joost, Karen, Pauline, Wouter, Hein, Ernst, Tom, Kowell, a bit of the progress that we have been making in the past five years in uh, the Netherlands. So uh, first, a little bit about your typical Dutch restoration pilot. Um, so uh, most of the projects and the restoration efforts have been pioneered by NGOs or nature conservation or, uh, organizations, but now it's much more broader cooperation among governments, um, research institutes, offshore companies, hatcheries, consultancies, and NGOs. And we're doing these projects in uh, different areas, including the North Sea coastal zone, Delta, Wadden Sea, and also the offshore deeper North Sea. Um, and all of these projects are, are taking on a learning by doing approach. So making sure that we distill the success factors and, and advance our scientific knowledge, uh, but at the same time, uh, actually restoring shellfish reefs. So here you see some of the restoration pilots. Uh, you can check back maybe at a later point. Um, I wanted to dive into some of these lessons that we've learned you know, uh, from our nearshore projects. Um, so first of all, we've learned uh, and discovered what we have left to work with. Uh, so there's a mixed shellfish reef in the Four Delta um, that's uh, 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 40, 40 hectares and counting. So it's developing. Um, there's a discovery of individual native oysters on, on, on different uh, shipwrecks and there's a small population in the Wadden Sea. Uh, we're learning a lot about uh, what locations are suitable to do active restoration. And even when the, the pilot or the experiment isn't successful, uh, we're still learning uh, about, you know, suitability of the habitat for shellfish reefs. But also in this case, for example, when we had to clear away some of these reef walls, um, from a site that wasn't suitable for, for shellfish reef restoration. Uh, basically, it was raining eels, hundreds of eels. So then in that case, we're learning about other species and habitats. So uh, very useful. Uh, we know from our sites that shellfish reefs support six percent more biodiversity than adjacent sandy patches. The Pacific oysters that facilitate native oysters uh, we know now that we have both Bonamia uh, free zones and Bonamia infected zones, so uh, we have to deal with both. Um, and we know there's not one way to roam, and it's it's very wise to not choose one way to roam because um, uh, we're exploring uh, opportunities with wild adults as well as uh, spat from hatcheries, as you can see here, the, the just recently de deployed. Uh, spat on reef um, that was um, uh, placed in the Fort Delta. Some of the lessons learned uh, near shore include uh, lessons uh, around techniques for monitoring, about substrate and about active introduction. So some of these include um, the types of materials, what works, uh, we're testing all of these on the uh, on the right here, the, the oyster cradles, baskets, pet collectors. Um, we know about the temperature sum now, so when uh, the larvae are released into the water and to when to optimally deploy the substrate, um, how larvae migrate uh, to be able to model, model that um, and, and have some type of prediction of, of where to put the substrate in at what time. Um, and also what happens to individual oysters when you place them in, in offshore conditions. So we're learning about that. And um, uh, uh, on the other side, uh, with regards to outreach, what we've learned is basically whatever you do, whenever you talk to people, get really excited about being part of the active restoration uh, project. So uh, whether it's kids and, 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 and you know, um, going to schools and talking about this and education packages, 
um, uh, working with restaurants and businesses to recycle shells. Uh, we're working uh, together with uh, different organizations to develop a, a snorkel trail uh, to get people excited and to see, um, you know, the uh, the reefs that are out there. Um, the offshore sites uh, have also taught us a lot. Uh, first of all, that the active restoration of oyster reefs in deeper waters is possible, uh, as we've proven with the Borkham Stones uh, oyster reef, where we have multi-year survival growth, reproduction recruitment, um, development of a reef function, um, and, and so it can be done. And, and we've learned a lot about how, how to do it. Um, the 3D printed sandstone reef uh, structures have been really useful to kickstart the shellfish reef, uh, but they've also had a lot of other functions such as uh, physical protection of the site, uh, providing reference points for monitoring. Um, and yeah, so we're seeing from this site that the biodiversity gains are real and they're clear and uh, that shellfish reefs are, are an important tool to combat the biodiversity crisis. Uh, however, uh, the threats are, are, are uh, multiple and uh, they're real and they're close and um, they're actually having an effect. So uh, there's trawling going on. Uh, a gas platform is um, in the works uh, 700 meters away from our oyster reef. Obviously, we've, uh, uh, we are, we're trying to stop this gas exploration, but we'll have to see and uh, how that will pan out. There's shell and sand extraction. There's container disasters. So uh, really voluntary agreements are not delivering protection. and the government has committed to protect um, in general reefs, but also, you know, this site was was made here because there was to be a marine protected area and we still don't have it. So um, that's really a, a big issue. Uh, we need these uh, oyster reefs and locations to be protected um, because they're vulnerable to destructive activities. Uh, what we've learned so far from uh, different sites is that, you know, the wrecks really are oases in this degraded ecosystem and they can form, again, the building blocks for restoration efforts. So that's really interesting and something we're exploring uh, that we get a lot of excitement around uh, with the wreck dive team that's, that's placed oysters and that's monitoring the oysters. And obviously also the wind farms, uh, the wind companies that are placing oyster reefs in their research pilots um, uh, that um, can really contribute to restoring a source population, uh, creating some of these reef functions. Um, you know, we know a lot more about the scouring protection options, uh, uh, different forms of scouring protection and uh, what's working well. Um, obviously, there's there's an issue here uh, with wind farms and, and monitoring and safety restrictions and, and, and also the question about long-term uh, sustainability of the reef um, in light of the uh, decommissioning requirements. Um, yeah, and these are lessons that, that we're learning and that we're sharing. And the uh, Dutch Shellfish Reef Restoration Alliance that together we're working on, on filling the knowledge gaps and, and breaking the bottlenecks. Um, and uh, a little bit more about wind farm, I think in the next presentation about the lessons learned there. So uh, I won't discuss all of that here. Um, the knowledge gaps um, that we've identified together, so first of all, uh, scaling up, uh, what is success? When are we done? Uh, at small scale, at large scale, we need to come up with a plan basically, uh, and uh, an international plan for scaling up, uh, preferably. Um, and how do we ensure that we have the right materials? So we have sustainable substrate, we have uh, genetically diverse and, and reliably produced uh, spat from the hatcheries? Um, and how do we make sure that we improve success and survival of oysters um, in dynamic offshore conditions? So these are some of the knowledge gaps that uh, we hope to address and to work on. Um, in addition to that, um, 
Uh, how do we ensure that we have cost-effective um, monitoring techniques and making sure we can uh, analyze what works well for, for marine biodiversity? Um, being able to uh, measure and monitor uh, wild spatfall uh, cost-effectively, uh, measuring the value of goods and services arising from Oyster Reef, which will be important to open up new funding streams, uh, but also um, uh, for uh, the political will, hopefully, to, to protect and restore Oyster Reefs. Um, the spat on shell, um, if we can use that alone to kickstart uh, a self-sustaining reef, uh, we're testing that right now. Um, and, and, and also, if there's different ways to collect natural spat in situ, um, uh, to make sure that we, we stimulate development of reefs. So, so these are some of the knowledge gaps that we're hoping to address. Um, another fun slide is the key bottlenecks for scaling up. Um, no space for nature, big issue no protected status for native oyster reefs. Uh, this might lead to a loss of momentum. Really, we've been waiting since 2016 now for protected status um, to create some space. And um, this is threatening the investments made so far in active restoration and also future, uh, future efforts. So this is a problem that needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Um, in addition to that, the source material, we've talked about substrate, but also um, uh, wild oysters, um, oysters from hatcheries, uh, making sure that we have a, a steady supply uh, to scale up and have the funding to do that as well. And an additional bottleneck um, is the requirement for hatcheries to be bonamia free for th three years before they can get certified. Um, that's uh, potentially problematic and, and that, that requires a, a, a good discussion. Luckily, we have now the Dutch Shellfish Reef Restoration Alliance where we can address knowledge gaps together and fix these bottlenecks together. And we look forward to continued working with NORA and the other alliances to make sure that um, together we, uh, uh, we take the next steps in, in uh, uh, this really a challenging field and also fun and uh, rewarding uh, of, of active restoration of, of shellfish reef. Thank you so much for, for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, just to let you know that um, Carol van den Vingard has kindly agreed to step in for Emily to answer the question and answer in the question and answer session later on today, although I'm sure Carol would rather be snorkeling and Emily back here. But anyway, our next presentation um, is from Renata Olli. Renata is a marine ecologist working for the North Sea Foundation. And together with Strictly Nature Milieu, excuse my pronunciation, the foundation started the program, The Rich North Sea. Thanks to the postcode lottery, The Rich North Sea is enhancing nature in offshore wind farms. And this presentation is titled The Status of Offshore Wind Farm Borsell 3 as a New Flat Oyster Habitat. Thank you. Hi, my name is Renate Auli and I'm a marine ecologist working for the Ritz North Sea. I will present you the status of offshore wind farm Borsell 3 as a new flat oyster habitat. This project is a collaboration between the Blau Wind Consortium and the Ritz North Sea in which Blauwind is the wind farm operator of Bosch 3 and 4. We also have Eurofins Aquasense on board, who is our scientific consultant in this project, and Van Oort as a marine contractor. I will tell you about the project design, the oyster installation and T0 monitoring of last year with some results, and the shell installation and T1 monitoring of this year with some first results, and an outlook into the future. So the Bosch Wind is located in the south of the Netherlands, with the oyster site being at local at Boschelof 3 and the reference site at Boschelof 4. Historically seen, it's not likely that there has been an oyster bed here uh, in the past, but uh, the conditions were right to try and create an oyster reef over here. So we tried to do that with these oyster tables, 
um, with each of them having eight baskets with oysters on it. And we place them on the scarab protection of the wind turbines. So in the right corner, you can see the four monopiles with a filter and armor layer of rocks around it. And we place them on the filter layer. Uh, and also you can see this blue area, which is a layer of shells. And each time the oyster tail was located in a different direction compared to the currents and the pile. So October 2020, we outplaced these 2400 adult flat oysters from Ireland. Um, and we also measured all the length and width of these oysters and took some environmental DNA samples and uh, performed an ROV survey for the general biodiversity. Uh, some results of these uh, length and widths, these were uh, very nicely distributed between all the baskets and uh, between the tables as well. Some uh, ROV footage, we found this spiny spider crab, which is well almost a new species to the Netherlands. The last uh, reported one was over 50 years ago, so wind farms might actually be a nice habitat for this species. In total, we found 49 species with the video analysis and environmental DNA found 48 species, but the overlap was only 11. Um, so it's really additional. It's also because the DNA found a lot of tiny and pelagic species. So now we jump into this year, July. Uh, we installed some shells, a mixture of it, but mainly uh, ensis. And hopefully the timing was right so that if there were any oyster larvae in the water, they can attach to the shells uh, while they're still clean. It was 20, 20 cubic meters of shells uh, around eight wind turbines. And we placed it mainly on top of the filter layer as it was difficult to get too close to the monopile uh, to place it on the armor layer. Also, we repeated most of the monitoring from the T0, but now we only measured one third of all the oysters per basket. And we took water samples for larvae analysis, and we took a subsample for oysters to check on bonemia, the reproduction status, and its pet. Well, some good news. The survival of the flat oysters was very high, over 96%, and also there was no bonemia found in the subsampled oysters. However, there was also no gonad development in the subsample. And why this is, we don't know yet, but we will look further into it. Also, there was a significant growth at every monopile. You can see the bar graphs of each monopile and the red ones, uh, well, the red measurements were from last year and the blue ones from this year. Um, you might also notice a, a non-significant difference between the growth of D4 and D7 or D5 and D6. And D5 and D6 were also the monopiles with the highest uh, survival. So there might actually be a difference between those uh, locations or between the locations of the oyster table compared to the currents. We don't know yet. Some nice uh, ROV photos from this year. We found over 15 flatfish just in this one frame of the video. Uh, conger eel, uh, sand mason worm, reefs, and also just bigger anemones, uh, hydrates, and other stuff that wasn't there in October last year. We also found a high biodiversity inside the baskets and on the tables. Uh, so different types of fish and crabs, slugs, shellfish, um, worms, and also this uh, um, species that looks a lot like oyster spats, but it isn't. These were the shell materials that we uh, installed on the, on the eight locations um, and well they were installed in piles but it's expected that most of it will be spread by the currents however within seconds already flatfish and starfish and crabs were wandering around it as a last thing we also found quite some overgrowth of the baskets and in order to reduce the risk of the oysters dying from a lack of food we thought uh, it was a good idea to place them back in clean baskets and also make a few bigger holes in it as we will come back over in two years. So that's a longer period than the last uh, period of time. As an outlook, um, some uh, results on the larvae in the water and 
environmental DNA are expected very soon. The ROV analysis will be scheduled for next year, and the next monitoring will be in 2023 and in 2028. I hope I gave you some insights in uh, just one of our offshore projects. We have many more, but also onshore and international, and I hope that you enjoyed it. I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to thank Blauwind for being our project partner. And if you have any questions, I will be here to answer your questions. Thank you. I'm now going to go to Luke Helmer, and Luke um, will be talking about the Solent Oyster Restoration Project, giving us an update from there and a, a shift towards integrated habitat restoration. Uh, so Luke Helmer, Dr. Luke Helmer, is a restoration science officer for Balloon Marine Foundation, working on habitat restoration, including oyster restoration, seascape restoration, and the potential of wind farms for restoration activities. Over to you, Luke. So if all goes to plan, everyone should be able to see my screen now. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Alison. Today I'm going to be giving a brief update on our most recent developments around scaling up our oyster restoration, but also moving towards a seascape approach and including other habitats within that. So for those of you that aren't aware, we are working in the solar, which you can see in this image here. Uh, the Solent was once home to Europe's largest oyster fishery, native oyster fishery. Around 15 million oysters were taken out each year at the end of the 1970s, and that equates to around 840 tonnes. So a phenomenal amount of oysters and potential habitat that was removed from the waterways around here. There has always been a boom and bust in production, and at the peaks there are around 450 vessels, around 700 workers on those as well. So it provided a substantial amount of income to the local uh, community as well. There was, however, a sharp decline that didn't recover from around 200 to 20 tonnes over around a five or six year period. And in 2013, the fishery was actually closed by the local authority. And it was during this time that the IFCA approached Blue and other stakeholders in the area to look into the feasibility of a restoration project. So this isn't just run by us, although we are spearheading the project, it is a massive collaborative effort. There are so many stakeholders and different organizations involved in this with the research and the monitoring, but also to the compliance and all of the kind of ecological status, but also the navigation and the logistics in the areas that we're working. So for those of you that aren't aware, the Solent is the stretch of water that separates the Isle of Wight from mainland UK. And across this area, we've been working with a variety of different techniques. Uh, the first of which we developed was our broodstock nurseries. And this is where during the latter stages of the fishery, we actually managed to buy back the broodstock and place them into sanctuary sites that you can see here um, across the Solent in an effort to utilize those oysters rather than them ending up on the plate, the larvae from those would be dispersed back into the Solent. So we have a variety of active and unactive. That's just uh, simply because we are restocking and monitoring different populations. We also have our reef site, which I'll give an update today, and the hatchery, which anyone that was in the student session would have found out uh, a little bit about from Monica and the team there. So all of that work that went into the broodstock nursery systems has now been published in yet another handbook. It's fantastic that there are so many handbooks coming out now around native oyster restoration. Um, so this was launched recently and it gives a kind of practical approach to how you can set up nurseries and how you can go about doing that in different environments. Uh, for us in the Solent, again, uh, really interesting to hear about this in the other talks. Uh, we also found unexpectedly initially critically endangered European eels in some of our sites as well. And this has been expanded and there are posters and other talks about the Wild Oysters Project, but we have now found those critically endangered eels at all of our restoration hubs around the UK. So there's clearly something going on here with those eels. We've also found 129 other species in the Solent as well, so clearly acting as artificial reefs. Um, so this is how they uh, initially started and those kind of designs have developed over time. But again, it's a fantastic outreach and education tool, allows children to get hands on, get dirty and get immersed in the experience. 
more recently we've actually scaled up our operations um we were successful in getting a marine license we have three sites within within that license the first of which we've developed was langston harbour where we've deployed uh 361 meters cubed of shell and gravel uh, which was around seven barge loads and to date we've restored 15,000 oysters onto that and hopefully in the near future another 20,000 will go onto that so the other two sites are the River Hamble and a site on the Isle of Wight in Newtown Creek. So this was uh, a fairly long and arduous process. We work in one of the busiest waterways in Europe. There's so many different users of the environment. There are also so many designations in the area as well. So working within that, we had to select uh, areas that were subtidal mixed sediment, that were the correct depth and a whole host of, uh, of other factors went into that. And one of the other key ones, which was actually introduced by the IFCA, was a no bottom toed gear uh, bylaw, which enabled us to have areas that were kind of sanctuary sites protected by law that we could deploy oysters into and know that they were legally protected. A whole host of surveys went into this from identifying potential areas, ground truthing that, and then double checking the depth and getting baseline surveys. So this is uh, an example of what the seabed looks like in Langston Harbour before we did any of our restoration work. You can see um, the area is dominated by Crepidula, the American slip and limpet. Um, in previous surveys, we found that up to 4,043 per meter squared in some of the harbours. So a very uh, prolific invasive species uh, makes it very muddy and very silty, obviously not ideal for oyster settlement. So we started this year with our scaling up and building the reefs. So you can see moving towards larger scale, bigger machinery. Um, and these are the barges that we were using to load that. So seven of these barge loads. Uh, we mixed the shell and gravel throughout the process. So from the delivery to the loading and then out onto the reef as well to enable it to mimic what the seabed would have been like before. Again, there was so many logistics that were involved within this and tides. Uh, shipping chains, um, channels, and all of the harbour authorities were involved throughout the process. Uh, and throughout the process, again, we were monitoring this and adapting this. So initially, the, um, the company we're working with were planning on dropping the shell and gravel from the surface, but we realised the shell material was obviously less dense and dispersed further. So we were very careful with our deployment of this. They used the excavator to place this on the seabed and then flatten that throughout. So scaling up and again, doing, uh, learning by doing. And this to give you an idea of the scale, although we are starting to scale up, it's still on a very small scale in terms of the rest of the harbour. The oysters we got from that, uh, again, a lot of uh, logistics are based around that. Uh, we got those from one of John's site up in Scotland. These have been on grown in these autacks here. For anyone that's not familiar with these, these can be placed intertidally or subtidally, and they essentially rock with uh, any currents and the tides and reduce oyster native oyster mortality uh, as opposed to with the traditional trestle setup, which uh, the farmers and the growers say that they get a higher mortality with. So as you can see, they were fairly clean. They come out of these with a few barnacles and, and, and other species on there, but we did visual inspections as part of our biosecurity protocol. Obviously, we're moving them from Scotland to the Solent uh, using all of the experience with Nora and the handbooks that have been produced. Um, this made our process very easy, working out what we needed to do throughout that. Um, again, you can't avoid the long drive. So that um, there was, again, a lot of logistics around this. And Part of our biosecurity protocol involved sorting through all of these oysters in the lab. So they were put into a static tank and throughout the process observed for any invasive species that we don't have. We did death-based studies before. Uh, I guess in a sense in the Solent, we're fairly lucky we have all of the invasive species that you can think of. Um, but again, we don't want to introduce any more. We want to minimize that. So throughout the process, we were sorting through, removing any organisms and all of the oysters went through a bleach bath as well. And I unfortunately did when one of the handles on the bucket gave way. Um, so unintentionally cleaned the lab afterwards as well. Again, you can see we had a lot of volunteers. There's a lot of man hours and women hours that go into this. So a lot of this sorting took place uh, over the course of the day. Again, a very thorough biosecurity protocol. And the final part of that was actually kind of lining it up, getting it 
all sorted with the previous uh, monitoring that we'd done. And then we went over the reef at a known speed and deployed the oysters at a known rate so that we could get the required density. Obviously, we are uh, working within a Bernamia positive area, so we don't want the density to be too high, uh, but at the same time, we want them to be reproductively viable. So you can see here um, uh, an example of the area that we're working in. We had a trial site and then a slightly larger site as well. Uh, again, using the handbooks that have been produced and uh, further knowledge, um, we're working our way through the monitoring of this reef. All of the points that you can see on the map are actually where we've done video surveys. So we're going through that to get an idea of exactly where the reef is and the oyster density so that when we deploy more oysters, we can do that in a targeted manner. And then periodically, we'll also be going and grab surveying to do the oyster density, particle size analysis and biodiversity. We'll also take subsamples and assess the disease stages and prevalence as well. So this is again another area that is just slightly off of the reef and how that looks on the seabed. And then this is an area that you can see on the reef and how that's changed. So you can see a good mix of shell and gravel. And I'll give a second to see how many oysters you can spot. Um, but again, this was one of our the better areas where we got the required density. Um, so you can actually see there are native oysters all over this patch. And we are taking our oyster densities off of uh, an expected mortality. So these are juvenile oysters going on and then anticipating the density of when they reach maturity. Looking further into the future um, and actually and more recently as well, we are scaling up how we visualize the restoration, not only of oysters, but a wider whole ecosystem approach. So looking at other habitats, the seagrass, the salt marsh and kelp, in the areas and being aware of what other people are doing around us. And that's how we see the, the uh, seascape approach working and the connectivity, not only between the habitats, but also the people working on these habitats as well and combining forces so that we get the most out of people's effort. Um, and this is what it looks like in practice. This work is already going on. So it's about a matter of joining the dots and working with people. Uh, you can see an example here of us collecting uh, seagrass seeds and also deploying structures for salt marsh restoration. Uh, again, there are various people uh, from the team here virtually, so please do have a chat with those. And then again, another example of that, uh, combining oyster and salt marsh restoration in the bottom right-hand picture here, you can see we glued 5,000 oyster shells to these potato stru starch structures in order to assess any natural recruitment in areas where we're doing our salt marsh restoration. And thank you very much for listening. If anyone has any questions, I'll be around pretty much all of the conference. Thanks very much, Alison. Um, yeah, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Betsy Peabody as our, our keynote speaker for today. Um, I've actually had the privilege of working with Betsy since the, the mid 2000s. Um, and that was nearly 10 years after she began restoring marine habitats in the Puget Sound area of Washington state. Uh, around the Seattle area um, in the northwest of the US. Um, so she has considerable experience um, at marine habitat restoration. It's certainly not just um, the native oyster restoration, the um, Austria species that she's working with on the west coast of the US, um, but she has really pioneered um, oyster restoration on the west coast and in that last 25 years um, Betsy and the Puget Sound Restoration Fund that she is in charge of um, has really taken the field of native oyster restoration on the west coast from a pretty lonely idea in the in the late 90s um, to what is accepted as very important um, well beyond the community that are involved in restoration now it's it's becoming a, a reasonably public um, uh, concept which is wonderful um, to see so it gives me great pleasure um, to ask Betsy to describe some of her work um, and I'll, I'll hand over to you Betsy Peabody. Thank you so much <clears throat> I so appreciated listening to some of the previous discussion <clears throat> and just hearing some of your concerns and I want to say that I wish I were there with all of you um, because that would be so much more fun 
Um, but I enjoy seeing your faces and thanks to Bose for that introduction. And it's been wonderful working with Bose and the Nature Conservancy and so many others. So I appreciate uh, that you invited me here to give a presentation and I look forward to meeting you um, at some point in person. So as, as Bose said, uh, I work in the state of Washington in the Pacific Northwest corner of the United States. And you can see on the map there um, where our geographic area is. And I've been working on Olympia oyster, Austria lurida restoration since 1999. And I have learned so much from this oyster and from all the people with whom we've worked on restoration. And I think I started out with ideas of my own um, and I was pulled into it because I could sense the importance of this biogenic living marine habitat. Um, but I don't think I had any idea uh, that that pull was not to me alone, um, but to so many different people in the community. So. Um, I think it's Max who's advancing my slides. Thank you, Max. Let's go to the next slide. So when I first started out again, I really thought that I was diving in to um, sort of pulling up my sleeves and, and working in a hands-on fashion to rebuild Olympia oysters and indeed, that has been a big part of what we've done. But what I've discovered along the way is that native oysters are the perfect vehicle for building our human community, for reconnecting people to marine resources and engaging diverse partners. Um, it's not just me who's, who feels the pull uh, to reconnect to living marine resources. It's really many people. Next slide. So one of the wonderful things about Olympia oyster, and I think that your edgeless species is a little bit bigger, but I think that this still applies, is that it is a little oyster. It's a little oyster in a big world. And when it's distributed sparsely, um, it doesn't really do all that much for the marine ecosystem. But when you have dense assemblages of it, there is collective power in that. And, and as a result of that, this little oyster that's not much to look at um, has really played a very big role in my part of the world. And, um, and so it has been a, an important part of the history of this place, the foods of this place. And that is really an essential part of the work that we've been doing is tapping into that. Next slide. So when you embark on these native oyster restoration projects, um, although there is just so much science there to occupy not just one lifetime, but many lifetimes, it's really important to engage people in the full big story, not just of the oyster, but all the people who have been connected to the oyster, humans who have an age old connection to marine resources and oysters that are part of living shorelines that we depend on for our health and future. Next slide. So the Olympia oyster story in our part of the world, um, you can see on the map, there's a green line that traces the historic extent, extent of this oyster along the western coast of North America. And then you can see in the picture on the right what that historic <clears throat> assemblage looked like on, on the beach. And clearly Olympia oysters in that place at that time were a dominant species, a dominant structure. Um, and so we have some really good pictures of what it looked like. Um, Olympia oysters were nestled in protected bays and inlets, you know, from BC down to Baja. Um, they weren't everywhere, okay? They weren't in high energy shorelines. They were sort of in these heads of bay kind of situations. Um, and the estimate is that in 
1850, they covered somewhere around 10,000 to 20,000 acres. And I think that people know that that's a conservative estimate. Um, so even though they weren't everywhere, um, overall, they covered a significant part of the intertidal habitat in Puget Sound. So 13 to 26% of the intertidal area. So they were a significant feature of the historic shorelines in Puget Sound. Remarkably, for a little oyster, um, sparse numbers still exist throughout their historic range. And clearly, they have been pummeled by many things over the years, cut back. Um, you know, there was over harvest, there was habitat loss, there was pollution. Um, so there are a lot of things that contributed to the decline of native oysters, but they're still nestled in places you can find them. And it's a wonderful sort of treasure hunt to embark on. Next slide. So the human part of that story, I'll just sort of start with the map on the upper right. Um, just the out of Africa story. Um, and you can see all of these coastal migration routes, many of which were coastal migration routes um, where the people followed to move around the world. And, and as they did that, of course, they were dependent on the resources um, that they found along the way. So early trailblazers migrating along the West Coast fed on oles, Olympia oysters, as well as many other marine resources. Tribes subsisted on native resources as they settled in our part of the world, Puget Sound, the Salish Sea, and Olympia oysters were one of their first foods. Pioneering settlers ate oles when the tide was out and early shellfish growers launched an industry. The shellfish industry that we have here still today was founded on this oyster, the Olympia oyster. So it has a storied place in the way that our state and our communities have developed. And so we restore na native oysters today. I certainly do, not just for the ecosystem, but for us. Um, as part of this larger human story. Next slide. So what I've discovered in doing this work is that there are so many portals for entering the Olympia oyster story. And, and really, it's just simply about inviting people to jump into one of their one of those portals, whatever it happens to be for them. And it becomes this wonderful unifying thing that you can share with people um, who come from different perspectives and, and, and different backgrounds. Next slide. So tribes are so much a part of the story of this oyster and also what we're doing to restore this oyster. They embody Olympia oysters cultural importance in our part of the world. We exist in a place where there are many um, tribes. And when you work in the water on the tide flats, you're working in the usual and accustomed fishing areas of tribes. And what you do needs to preserve first foods. It needs to preserve their treaty rights. So always we work in partnership with the tribes um, to try to restore native oyster beds in their home waters. Um, they honor these oysters as traditional tribal food, food source, and they help authorize the work we do on tide flats. Next slide. We definitely work with growers. They are holders of knowledge, and they have shared that knowledge, and they have worked to preserve heritage. And there's so much about the Olympia oysters that I've heard, that I've learned from growers. This picture is of Bill Taylor. And then the picture to the right is some of the early techniques that were used to grow and harvest Olympia oysters. Next slide. We also work with government agencies. They have many portals through which they can enter this story. And, 
and they can help in all kinds of ways. They can lead initiatives, they can loan equipment barges, they can provide funding. And we've received you know, a lot of funding from government agencies as well as foundations and individuals and tribes. Um, they've helped us build a hatchery that we operate collaboratively with NOAA and that is partially funded now by the state. So there are just many ways in which their partnership has been instrumental in the work we're doing. Next slide. The hatchery that we established in 2014 is called the Kenneth K. Chu Center for Shellfish Research and Restoration. And this is, has been an important part of building our effort res to restore Olympia oysters at scale in Puget Sound because we're using two, really maybe three different techniques um, to restore the oyster and in areas where we've lost breeding populations, um, principally in the Northern part of Puget Sound, we need to produce seed that is restoration grade that preserves the genetic diversity of populations in that area so that we can outplant those seed and start to rebuild a breeding population as sort of a precursor then to trying to reestablish the habitat. So having a hatchery um, that enables us to do that has been really important. We worked initially with commercial hatcheries and they were extremely generous in providing in-kind support and producing seed for some of our early seeding efforts. But in order to take this on in a bigger way, we really needed to establish our own um, seed center. So you can see in the pictures down on the bottom, the various species that we produce in this hatchery, Olympia oysters on the left, Pinto abalone, our only native abalone species, kelp seed of various kinds. We've produced bull kelp seed and sugar kelp seed, sea cucumbers and cockles, all important resources in different ways. Next slide. So the hatchery was dedicated in 2014 and the Chu Center honors the longstanding contributions of Ken Chu, who is featured on the left hand of your screen. He was a university, oh, let's go back to the previous slide. He was a University of Washington professor and he's sort of considered one of the patriarchs of the shellfish aquaculture industry. And he's sort of been here, there and everywhere. And there are also faces here of many of the people who helped to establish that foundational hatchery for us. And I spent a little time focusing on this because Bo said that that was one of the interests of this group. Next slide. So, we work with scientists in all kinds of ways, not just the scientists who um, are part of our own organization at Puget Sound Restoration Fund, our team that has grown over the years, but we work collaboratively with scientists from many different organizations and agencies, and that's been such an important part of our work. If we're setting, about, if we're setting out to restore native oysters because we believe that they can be part of and should be part of our larger efforts to rebuild seascapes and resilient marine ecosystems. Well, you need to document that and you need to work strategically and, and wisely so that you are doing work in the right places. Um, and, and that takes a whole lot of science. It's complicated to zero in on those places. And so we're just um, very happy to be collaborating with people and then working with them to really understand the many benefits of restoring that structured habitat in the lower intertidal area so that it is a benefit to many species, including salmon. Next slide. We also work with restaurants and chefs. That's a nor another portal through which people can enter the Olympia oyster story and the effort to rebuild Olympia oysters. Um, they, it, it's just so wonderful to work with chefs and restaurants to create feasts that really give us a taste of this oyster that is a perfect concentrated package that is the taste of this place. And, um, and there's just no better way to reach people than through their stomach. 
and um, in sort of a joyous celebratory fashion. So that's been a big part of what we've done to engage people in this story over the years. Next slide. Researchers, there's just so much to look into when you're trying to figure out how to do this thing that you're all trying to do and where to do it. So identifying historic locations, also delving into ocean acidification and the effect of, of these um, changes in conditions on the Olympia oysters or the native oysters in your case that you're trying to restore and how can the restoration that you're doing in fact help to mitigate the effects of ocean acidification by helping to mitigate nutrient pollution that might otherwise drive um, greater pulses of CO2 um, during its, its it, the, de the, the decomposition of that um, of those algae blooms, um, looking into the genetics. There are just lots of different ways in which we work with researchers and they too want to enter um, through their portal into this larger story and become part of this bigger effort. Next slide. There are so many oyster devotees who have developed along the way um, as we've been building this program over the last couple of decades plus. Um, so much so that in partnership with the Nature Conservancy and in partnership with the University of Vancouver um, and others, you know, we've launched an expedition and really many smaller expeditions to go map out um, the largest known Olympia oyster bed on the West Coast. And what I mean by larger, largest is not really the spatial extent of it, but the remarkable density of Olympia oysters in this location on the northwest coast of Vancouver Island in a place called Port Eliza, a dense aggregation of native oysters in these pocket beaches where you have over 600 oysters per square meter and they are the dominant player in that, um, in that particular zone. Next slide. And then writers and worker, writers, excuse me, and reporters. As you're doing this work, again, there are so many people who want to enter this story and help tell the story of Olympia oysters um, through art, through stories. This is a book by Rowan Jacobson, and he documented the expedition we took to the northwest coast of Vancouver Island and wrote this book about it, which of course helps to engage others as they discover this book and start thinking about how to restore a living shoreline that can feature some of the resources that have been an historic part of the places where we work. Next slide. Volunteers want to help out in all kinds of ways. In fact, it's really impossible for us to keep up with it um, because we're trying to focus on doing the work and keeping the work funded, um, but really people want to engage with this effort. And one of the ways has been by getting them involved in hunting for broodstock, for instance. Um, we need to collect that in the middle of the night on the low tide, just before we bring those oysters to the hatchery to spawn and produce seed. Um, so that's just one of the ways in which volunteers have engaged on this in this particular project. Next slide. Another way is just simply by embarking on the treasure hunt of finding Olympia oysters. If you look um, on the upper right hand um, at that picture in the upper right hand and the gloved finger pointing to that native oyster. Honestly, like that is a very cryptic thing. It is not easy to see that unless you're looking for it, unless you're looking for it in the right place. And, and so it's, it's so fun to get people um, engaged in that treasure hunt and to give them sort of the search in image for how to look for this thing. Because again, it still exists sparsely um, in little nooks and crannies if you know where to look. And when you find it, it gives people such an enormous and profound sense of almost food security, like there are still resources in the world that can feed us 
if we can only figure out how to build that up, um, rebuild that signal and that resource. So, so, you know, putting together an Olympia oyster field guide and engaging property owners who want to do this on their tide land and people who want to know and see and experience that resources are still here. That's been a big part of what we've we've done and one of the significant portals for engaging people. Next slide. Artists, of course, have also wanted to get in on the action in all kinds of ways and help produce beautiful oyster skirts and regalia that we can wear to our various um, celebrations and, and, and paint and capture the beauty of this oyster um, for logos or for whatever materials and brochures you're sending out. Um, it's been fun to engage with them on that. Next slide. So the Native Oyster Ven is full of, it, it's got this beautiful crossover with so many different kinds of people. And so I think that when you start out on a journey like this, the journey that you are all on, it's not clear at the get-go that you're going to be able to get people to really get involved and get involved in a big way, build it with you and really bring the, bring the resources that you need. Um, but I think that you'll discover as I have discovered that there, that, that oysters can be a unifying and galvanizing um, feature for many, many different groups within your communities. Next slide. People fall in love with this oyster and embark on lifelong journeys. I myself have. I am a testament to that. And I'm not alone. We live in a world that has fed us for thousands of years. Oysters give us a reason and an ally in our efforts to clean local marine waters. And so um, this, this oyster and your oyster can be a tool for rebuilding resources, first foods, resilient marine, seas resilient marine um, systems, but also a tool for building communities. Next slide. Finding beauty in mucky, productive ooze is a big part of the adventure. Where we are and where native oysters exist in our place, you know, these are oftentimes mucky places. And they're mucky places where you can't initially even see that oysters are there. They're not like the Pacific oyster. They don't jump out and grab your attention. They're not immediately noticeable. Um, so it's funny actually to pull people into these places um, and, and really start to see the little significant thing that in big numbers is in fact beautiful. You come to see it as beautiful. But it's also funny to try to work on stories and to bring reporters out to these places and to try to film successful restoration sites. And the picture in the lower right-hand corner is of one of our most successful restoration sites. You can see that we've rebuilt Olympia oysters there in dense aggregation so that it's a dominant feature of that tidescape. But when you describe that to people and get them to take the time to come out and film it, because you're telling them it is a beautiful and remarkable thing. And then you bring them out to a place that looks like that in the lower right hand corner. And they're thinking, oh my goodness, like that's not coming across as beautiful. So it's really just sort of changing how people think about beautiful and, and, and seeing something that's productive um, and, and so important ecologically as beautiful is, of course, part of what you're trying to do. It's great. Next slide. But really the ultimate gift for me is learning from the oysters and from the natural systems around us. Um, about the importance of being a community builder in your own community. Oysters 
like coral reefs here in this picture, are community builders. That's what they are in their essence. And we need to do in the human world what oysters do in the watery world, rebuild community structures that support life and diversity. And so you start out, I started out rebuilding Olympia oysters and thinking that really I wanted to bring a singular focus to that. Um, and what I found is that that is a path for rebuilding our own communities and reconnecting to those resources that are so important for us. Next slide. So restoring Oles is a great comeback story. People want to be part of a comeback story, particularly as our own societies and communities have unraveled in really unexpected ways, particularly over the last two years, but over a much longer period. So it's the chance of a lifetime that you're giving people when you invite them to do this work with you, the chance of a lifetime to rebuild native oysters in sweet protected spots so that they can become once again, a living habitat that increases coastal resiliency and supports our habitation. Next slide. So remember, as you work on all the beautiful dimensions of the science, remember that this is a human story. Oysters have been a rich part of our heritage as humans have been migrating around the world and settling for the last 300,000 or so years. People yearn to be so part of something that's enduring, that's good, that's meaningful. And so you are inviting them to engage on something that will be a significant part of their life. So do not hesitate to invite them and to be creative, as creative as you can to get them to enter through the many portals of your effort to restore native oysters. And I think that's it. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back uh, to the next session this afternoon. Um, after a fabulous um, uh, presentation, uh, presentations in the last session, and also some really interesting uh, observations from uh, Betsy Peabody. Um, so I'm going to invite you to disappear uh, down a, uh, another particular uh, portal. Um, this time, uh, this is the, um, the site selection session. Um, and we have um, with us uh, today a selection of great speakers. Um, and the first one up is, um, uh, is Dr. Bernadette Pagoda, um, who is... Um, the senior scientist at AWI uh, with a focus on research and development of marine conservation measures and restoration management in marine protected areas. Uh, she coordinates the German project uh, Restore and Proceed uh, for the restoration of native oysters in the German Bight. Um, so uh, the next speaker up is Bernadette uh, Pagoda. I'm seeing Brecht at the moment, but I guess Max, you're going to queue that up. Thank you very much. Dear Nora colleagues, I will share some of our findings and ideas about the remains of an ancient Austroagilis bed, which we recently discovered. Due to the substantial loss of oyster beds in the German Bight and the severely degraded state of remaining populations, no profound ecological baseline and no reliable data on former biogenic reef structures exist for that sublittoral zone. And this study investigated a recently discovered fossil oyster bed located near Helgoland in order to facilitate a long missing description of such a sublittoral bed. We chose the site selection session for this topic to discuss what we can learn and transfer from our findings when selecting restoration sites. All the detailed information is available in the article published by Lasse Sander and uh, his colleagues. And the aims of the study are to obtain basic information on the location, composition and age, age structure of this dead oyster bed 
and to provide a new perspective on the past existence and state of such subliteral habitats. The map on the left shows the German Bight, the coastline in green, in the North Sea, and the dotted areas mark the historical distribution of Austria, Edulis oyster grounds extracted from the well-known Olsen map. And uh, the dead oyster bed was discovered in video surveys. It is located near Helgoland, as you can see with the marking B, in the eastern part of these offshore oyster grounds in 30 to 44 meters of water depth. So profiling this ancient oyster bed. Repeated video transect and grab samples were taken to examine and describe the bed. As of today, it is three kilometers long and 400 meters wide, located at the edge of the island's geomorphological base, following a moderate slope of around one degree over the 400 meter width. You can see the markings of the grab samples. The yellow markings um, indicate samples with oyster shells, and the Xs um, indicate um, grab samples without oysters. You can see that uh, the bed is located around three to four kilometers west of the island itself. And on the right side of the map, you can see the well-known historical oyster bed described um, by Caspers et al. in 1950. So this was the bed we knew of around Helgoland. The oyster shell form a pronounced band within these isobaths, as you also can see on the left side in this map again. And at the deeper edge of the bed, they, the shell dip under the sediment. And so far, we have no idea if the bed was even wider and is today covered by sediment, or how deep or how thick the shell layer and former biogenic structure is. And on the right, you can see what we saw in our videos. So a lot of shell material covered by some kind of fine sediment and mud. On the left, you can also see markings where we discovered only mud, mud in our samples or in the videos, or where there were a mixture of oysters and mud, or only oysters. Um, further to the south and closer to the island, there were also oysters and stones. So our key findings um, allow the following assumptions. Um, the presence and abundance of uh, many different size classes of oyster shells and the fact that the oyster bed was mentioned in one historical source allows the conclusion that this was a true oyster bed, no shell midden or dumping site. And uh, the radiocarbon dating reveals the existence of the bed for around 2,500 years. So we assume that abiotic and biotic factors were appropriate over a long period. And with three kilometers length and 400 meter width, the size of the bed, and also by taking into account the complex current situation around Helgoland, we can assume that lava retention and recruitment on the bed was possible. Having a closer look at the tidal currents in the German Bight, we get deeper insights in potential lava distribution in the past and in the future. And we are currently working on modeling the lava drift across the different sources we know from historical documents and also um, looking into the future um, by considering potential restoration sites and the connectivity of these um, hopefully successful sites in the future. Around Helgoland, the current situation is indeed very complex, and this will need further investigation to allow conclusions related to the, um, for example, um, allow conclusions uh, uh, around the lava drift between the two existing oyster bands around the island. <clears throat> 
And uh, we will, of course, have a close look into the potential of one historical bed providing lava for the other one. And finally, can we identify the cause for the end of this oyster beds era? Um, I'm showing you a complex graph. I try to take you through it. At the bottom of this graph, um, part E, you can see the results of the C14 ages and that the demise of the population occurred around 700. A period of geomorphological activities of rivers, which you can see highlighted in part C, and also major land use changes in early medieval Europe. We suggest that increased sedimentation, which is indicated also in parts A and B, also in B as wind-driven hydrodynamic forcing, so that sedimentation was a potential stressor that reduced the performance of the oysters. The shells provided no indication of a demographically poor state of the oyster bed prior to its demise. As I already mentioned, that we had a, a number of different uh, size classes in, in the oyster samples. Um, but uh, it showed the evidence of the widespread occurrence of the boring sponge cleona. And uh, we suggest an explanation that goes in the di direction of sedimentation as a stressor and additional effects of parasite pressure, so to say a multi-stressor effect. What we know today is that Austria can counteract the sponge by producing thin layers in the inner shell, but that it is indeed um, a factor reducing the fitness, the physiological fitness of the animal. So we conclude that the combination of depth seabed morphology and resulting current patterns is of relevance and that, should, that we should carefully explore and consider the role of sedimentation and sediment dynamics. We should also investigate the long-term impact of predation and parasite pressure such as boring sponges and their role as additional stressors. And finally, to inform site selection for large scale restoration. Also model simulations of multi-stressor impacts may support future habitat analysis approaches. And with that, I would like to close and thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much, uh, Bernadette. So um, our next speaker is uh, Barbara Ondiviela, and um, she is a P has a PhD in marine sciences from the University of Cantabria and a researcher in the Environmental Hydraulics Institute. Her research is focused on better understanding the ecology of coastal ecosystems and their spatial and temporal dynamics. Uh, Max, could you cue that one up? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Barbara Andiviela. I work at the Environmental Hydraulics Institute of the University of Cantabria. And today I'm going to present you the historical ecology of the flat oyster in the Atlantic coast of the Iberian Peninsula. This study is a contribution of the Life Adaptablus project that aims to enhance the implementation of climate change adaptation strategies to the management and restoration of estuarine ecosystems. Oyster pets of Austria edulis once dominated numerous estuaries of the Iberian Peninsula, playing a key role both in the ecological integrity and in the economy of coastal populations. Unfortunately, centuries of intense exploitation led to the loss of these species in a relatively short period of time. So, to support the restoration of Austria edulis pets in the Iberian Peninsula, and strengthen the knowledge required for its restoration, we documented the historical ecology of the flat oyster and the areas historically colonized through the revision of scientific and great literature and the consultation of historical documents and local stakeholders. <laughs> 
With all this information, we created an inventory of the estuaries where Vets of Austria Edulis had been historically seated. And for each estuary, the reference found were sorted chronologically and the exact location was geographically positioned and represented in Google Maps. We obtained 134 references for the presence of the flat oyster, corresponding to 44 estuaries from Spain and Portugal since the Mesolithic to the present time, and we ranked the importance of oyster beds according to the number of references obtained, being the most seated, Santonia, Santander, and Suances on the north of the Iberian Peninsula, and Pontevedra, Vigo, and Taxus on the west coast. Detections from the Mesolithic and Paleolithic correspond to locations that today are far away from the coast, and the earliest reference describing oyster bed dates back to the 1785. Oyster is not the, the most abundant mollusk found in the prehistoric sites, but when it appears, it does in large proportions and sometimes forming enormous cell accumulations. Oyster were collected using selfish picks or pebbles, and cell tools were used for the working of food, plants, or animal skin. In the north coast of Spain, during the glacial period, the coastline was farther to the north. So the archaeological sites that could be located near the estuaries would be underwater today. In the Iberian communities between the four hundreds and the two hundreds before Christ, there is a clear link between the presence of selfies and the proximity to the coastline. And the Romans felt a great attraction for oysters when they colonized the Iberian Peninsula. Different Roman writers speak about the delivery of oysters from the Iberian Peninsula to the capital of the Roman Empire, Rome. And it is said that Apicius made a delivery to the Emperor Tiberian from Italy to Persia. Marcus Apicius was the first gourmet in history. He wrote one of the most complete works on the culinary art of classical Rome, the Recoquinaria, which included recipes and advices on food preservation, such as cleaning oysters with vinegar, as is still done today. As in the previous periods, in the Middle Ages, oysters were considered an elitist species and were consumed almost exclusively for the privileged tables of the aristocracy. We have consulted letters from 1541 where the Spanish Council of the Indies asked to the Bishop of Venezuela about the introduction of canoes and Indians in the oyster fisheries of Cabo de Vela suggesting the importance given in the 16th century to this resource. During the 1600th, oysters begin to be available with some frequency in inland markets far away from the coast. And in 1690, the Duke of Infantado explains in a letter that one of the gifts received by the queen in La Coruña were oysters. The first studies about the status of the oyster beds in the Spanish coast were carried out in the 1700s by Corní de Saavedra and Sañé de Reguard. Corní de Saavedra expressed his concern about the aesthetic extraction, and he is the first author to document the extinction of oysters at the end of the century. At that time, some cities, aware of the risk of extinction, decided to regulate and limit the extraction of oysters. Fishing was permitted from September to April, but the use of iron hooks for the extraction or fishing outside those months was fine. In 1792, it documented the extraction of oysters for the King Charles IV. The trip was intended to be done in 12 days maximum, because it was the time tolerated by oysters inside barrels. It seems that by this time, Apicius' knowledge of preserving oysters in vinegar had been lost because for the trip 
oysters were preserved by placing them fresh in their own salt that couldn't be opened or received air from the outside. Commercial oyster fishing in the natural bed of northern Spain began in the 1800s. At that time, most of the shellfish market was fresh, but another small part was brought to the market, processed both canned and pickled. From the mid-century, in the 1860 onwards, its arrival to stores was progressively greater, perhaps due to the number of concessions and to the improvement in railway transport and communication routes that made it possible to shorten the distances between the harvesting areas and the sale points. Coinciding with the start of commercial exploitation of the oysters, the declining catches begin. At the 1869, the naturalist Mariano Graels concluded that most of the beds in the north of Spain were exhausted due to overexploitation and proposes to declare beds of modern oysters reserved for the repopulation, the beds that remained in good conditions. Attending to his indications, a royal order raises in 1874 for the protection of certain estuaries. This was the first initiative to protect the Spanish oyster beds. The 20th century was the century of great changes. In the second half of the century, episodes of high mortality and overfishing reduced the European and Spanish population of Austria edulis. And despite the implementation of management practices and intensive restoration programs, the production never recovered. In the beginning of the 21st century, Bonamia Austriae is detected in Spain for the first time. All the strategies aimed at fighting Bonamia have failed, and Austria Eduli has practically disappeared from the Iberian Atlantic coast, where today its presence is sporadic and not consolidated in beds. The identification of area where Austria Edulis could be restored at the Iberian Peninsula scale was carried out through a two-step approach. The first step addresses the estuary where Austria Edulis is currently present, although, as far as we have documented, Austria no longer forms beds in these estuaries. And the second step identifies the estuary where the species were historically present and today meet favorable conditions for their settlement. So, estuaries hydromorphologically altered or with insufficient chemical or ecological status in the last six years were discarded for this second step. The final selection was integrated by 23 estuaries suitable for restoration from Spain and Portugal located in the west and north coast of the Iberian Peninsula in estuaries of both tidal and fluvial dominance, and representative of all the geomorphological patterns. From these 23 estuaries, two were selected to analyze the restoration potential of the flats, oysters, Santander and Santonia. The potential areas for restoration were evaluated considering together the biological suitability of the species and its habitat suitability. The biological suitability analyzes the historical data series and calculates the probability to find physicochemical optimal conditions for the growing of Austria edulis, while the habitat suitability evaluates aspects such as the bathymetry, granulometry, recovery time, current velocity, or water and sediment quality to find the optimal conditions for the settlement. The potential areas for restoration are then identified by overlaying the biological suitability and on the habitat suitability map. In both estuaries, salinity, temperature, and bathymetry are relevant variables. And in Santonia, the value of the potential areas for restoration today are above 60% in most of the estuary. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
So our next speaker in the session is uh, David Smith. Um, David is a, a scientific officer, is the scientific officer at the Shellfish Centre in Bangor, um, and Bangor University that is, and his research focuses on stock enhancement strategies for a variety of shellfish species, um, with a focus on the restoration of the native oyster um, from both a self-sustaining fishery perspective and as an environmental enrichment tool. Over to you, David. Yeah, many thanks, Bill. Um, right, yeah, so um, I just want to talk uh, about um, 20 years of research that I've been involved with in Strangford Lock and uh, maybe enlighten some of the uh, potential restoration projects or advise on some of the projects that are in, in uh, operation at the moment. Yeah, sorry, for those that don't know, uh, Strangford Lock, it's located up on the northeast uh, coast of Northern Ireland. It's a semi-enclosed sea lock. It's the largest in the British Isles at 150 kilometres square. Um, it's quite good conservation health. It's a designated SAC under the Habitats Directive. Uh, the history of the oyster in the lock, the date line matches that experienced in other countries. Um, Mesolithic shell middens along the shore. Um, it was... Uh, fished relatively sustainably up until the early 1800s, however, when the demand increased, uh, fishing intensity increased, and the fishery collapsed in 1903. Uh, we're quite privileged in the lock because we've got two examples of restoration, uh, one which was successful and one which uh, wasn't. Uh, the first uh, restoration um, project could be considered proactive. Uh, it happened in the uh, early 1990s. Um, and it uh, it was a, at a period when the oyster was considered biologically extinct within the lock. Uh, a group of local fishermen um, were managed to uh, get some EU funding to try and reignite the fishery. And with this money, they uh, deployed 75 tons of culch onto historical sites and 3,000 adults onto um, a source site. So they were using a source sink approach to the restoration. However, uh, five years of um, modern post project, um, no recruitment was, was uh, recorded and no population growth recorded. In fact, it appears that the hydrodynamics and the um, the sediment load of the historical sites had changed over the 200 years. Uh, there's a lot of agricultural input in those particular areas, and the cults actually uh, was disappeared after two years through heavy sedimentation, as did the um, adult oysters. The second uh, successful um, restoration was actually an inadvertent event from an aquaculture um, event. Uh, could be considered a passive approach uh, so initially an aquaculture, a local aquaculture grower over summered 125,000 native oysters on the low shore, uh, quite dense, um, quite high densities at over 50 per meter squared. And um, this had an obvious effect because population went from, the oyster went from being considered biologically extinct to having more than 1.5 million uh, within, by two, 2004. It's just I want to emphasize too, this is a one-off event. This wasn't a yearly occurrence. This happened once um, over, a, over a summer period. So of course, this initiated uh, quite a bit of interest in the academic field. And this where myself and my uh, old supervisor, the late Dr. Di Roberts got involved. And um, so we wanted to work out exactly where these high density sets uh, which had started to appear on the east, coast, east uh, shore of the lock actually originated from was at the aquaculture layers. So uh, with our colleagues in engineering, uh, we devised a particle tracking model using the um, aquaculture layers as the source site. Uh, if you look up in the top slides there, A and B, that's the dark patch um, on the left on the left hand side of the slide. So initially, the, when we ran the model, we used uh, current and tidal um, parameters. Uh, 
and the model predicted that the, the high density settlements would, would be in the central northern basin. Um, when we ground truth this, uh, we couldn't find any high density settlements. We found solitary settlements. Um, so we went back to the model and we added uh, wind into our model. Um, and the wind parameter was um, taken in cons into consideration the top five meters of the water column. And the output from the model in this instance, after adding the wind, uh, predicted the high density settlements um, exactly as to where we were finding them. So if you're going to use hydrodynamic modeling as a site selection tool, um, include wind. Uh, also ground truth the model because um, there's always uh, parameters which you can't consider in the data input into a model which could affect um, the predicted um, settlement sites. So this put us into a dilemma. We were trying to secure some funding for um, an expansion of uh, the newly restored population. And we wanted to, again, use a passive, uh, non-sort of intrusive approach. And we decided that we'd need to look at um, what considerations we'd need to take into, into place if we were going to select the broodstock uh, area. So the model again would be the, the tool of choice. And then we had the dilemma of intertidal or subtidal locations, um, both of the pros and cons, intertidal, uh, longer high temperature periods during the spawning months. However, the more vulnerable to anthropogenic and environmental disturbance. Subtitle, shorter temperature window uh, for the spawn to take place, although they're less vulnerable to disturbance and they are more difficult to monitor. And again, I just want to emphasize that initial restoration took place for moistures on the low intertidal. Um, so it's, it's we all, you need your sink sites to match your source sites. So the source, uh, broodstock source will supply the larvae to uh, the settlement sites, which we, we call these sink sites. So again, um, once we had selected a source site, which we thought we could get uh, legislation for, um, we ran the model uh, to see where the larval uh, settlement would be predicted to go. And then it was a matter of ground truth in those sites to see the natural culture coverage, eliminating sites where there wasn't particularly good culture coverage and twisting or uh, strategically positioning um, the broodstock site so it would um, feed sink sites with high culture uh, deposits or high shale deposits. It's important to ground truth either side of your site to allow for um, discrepancies in your modeling. And the one thing I would em emphasize here is don't ignore intertidal options if you're looking to do a passive uh, restoration approach because there's some excellent uh, shale deposits in the intertidal. I know the oysters are more difficult to, ma to manage and place, um, but they're easier to monitor too. Um, and it, it, if, if you're working on a limited budget, it's maybe a good option. The other thing I've discovered too, if possible, select a sink site where it has vacuumed adults already present. Um, when we looked at the high density settlements from the aquaculture uh, layers, it turned out the highest densities were at sites where there was some solitary uh, adults and some small assemblages. Um, so in future projects, we would recommend that uh, maybe seed potential sink sites with fecund oysters uh, prior to the spawn. Uh, and this is probably the, the one to take away as well. And in our particular um, experience, I know it might not apply to these restoration projects, but if possible, avoid fished areas when selecting both a source and a sink site. So uh, in 2004, we had our nice 1.5 million newly restored intertidal population. Um, this rapidly decreased to less than 400,000 within a year. And it was purely through unregulated harvesting. And there is something in this impact of, of gray area fishing or unregulated fishing or harvesting, whatever terminology you want to use. 
because in Strangford in the late 2000s, uh, fishing restrictions were introduced um, to protect uh, some subtidal habitats. Um, and as a result, the bulk of the oyster settlement sites in the north of the lock uh, fell into a protected zone. Uh, this zone is placed, placed regularly on uh, by the fisheries board. Um, in the new project with Ulster Wildlife Trust, the uh, native, uh, native oysters Northern Ireland, we have um, discovered quite some significant uh, increases in density. So um, an example being one site prior to the placed uh, zones was uh, showing densities of 0 0.003 oysters per meter squared. Uh, there has been a 10 year hiatus since this site was looked at, but the densities today are now 6.6 .6 per meter squared. And um, it really does look like um, this, this placing and protected zones is having a positive effect on, on our stocks in Strangford Lock. Uh, I'm sorry, that's just a quick snapshot of some of the things we've done over 20 years, but there's a, a plethora of, of information that I could give. So if you want to contact me via email, that's my email address there. And if not, catch me at the conference. And thank you for listening. David, uh, very fascinating story that. Um, I certainly have some questions of my own, which I'll get to later on. Um, okay, so our next um, speaker is uh, Brecht Steckler. Uh, Brecht is currently working towards his PhD at the University of Ghent uh, as part of the Horizon 2020 uh, Unite, uh, United uh, project, researching the interactions between native oyster aquaculture and restoration. So over to you, uh, Brecht. Hi, everyone. My name, as I said before, is Brecht Steckler. I'm a PhD student at the University of Ghent, and I'm modeling shellfish metabolism for aquaculture and restoration applications. Promote, the promoters of my work are Dr. Nancy Navian, Professor Peter Bossier, David Herrera, and uh, Alisa Joyce. The, actually, the main topic of my PhD is to perform a study that supports the Belgian flat oyster aquaculture and restoration. And the basis of this is a metabolic model for flat oysters, uh, which I built. Uh, actually, the model has a lot of applications, and some of these applications were included in the abstract. But recently, I worked on habitat suitability uh, index based on the metabolic model for flat oysters. And I thought it was uh, a lot more interesting to apply this model at a, a wider scale than only Belgian part of the board. So, first, actually, I wanted to give a talk about how suitable the Belgian part of the North Sea is for aqua, uh, oyster aquaculture. And this mainly because in the new marine spatial plan, there's new areas allocated for uh, aquaculture of flat oysters. But actually the Belgian part of the North Sea is quite homogeneous. So it's not really very spectacular to present here. Then I also thought about using the uh, metabolic model for habitat suitability of the Belgian part of the North Sea. But again, most of the Belgian part of the North Sea is covered by moving sand dunes, and only small parts uh, are, have actually suitable substrate for uh, oyster restoration. So I thought about um, increasing the scale of this study and apply the model uh, at the European scale. Then at the NORA Site Selection Work Group, uh, wonderful work has been done to collect the factors that are really important for selecting suitable sites for oyster restoration. And at the same time, I already had that model ready that could evaluate, for example, survival or the reproductive output of flat oysters at different locations. So I thought that that, that model was actually a good start uh, for a habitat suitability index. Short introduction on that model, the that model, the dynamic energy budget model, is a mechanistic model that simulates, in this case, the metabolism of flat oyster. It's a model that has 10 species specific parameters. And if you change these parameters, you can change the model from one species to another species. It was developed around 40 years ago by Bas Koyman, and there's a whole range of research fields that are using that model from aquaculture to ecology researching uh, and research in population dynamics, uh, but also evolution and connectivity. Uh, recently, we submitted uh, that model for, so we submitted that model for uh, flat oyster and compare it to the model for a Pacific oyster that gave insight into life history traits and 
provide the strategies of these boat oyster species. And the game, for example, also answers the questions such as how will that oyster do on climate change scenarios, uh, or how will climate change influence competition in these two oysters. In general, the metabolism always starts with the ingestion of food or energy intake. So food is ingested, part of it is, um, is digestible and goes, uh, will be assimilated. So the assimilation is a conversion of food to energy and the rest is a waste product as the species. So the energy that is assimilated is stored in a reserve and from the reserve, it goes to different functions. So energy is um, mobilized and goes to somatic maintenance, growth, uh, and reproduction. So this part is reproduction, and these are the somatic. Uh, somatic maintenance is actually is everything that keeps your animal alive. So it's energy for vital functions, blood flow, protein turn turnover, osmotic pressure, but also movement. Growth, or the energy that goes into growth is everything related to building of structural and functional tissue. Then there is a maturity, which relates to the development of a young oyster into a, an adult oyster. And from the moment your oyster reaches adulthood, it can start uh, allocating energy to reproduction or to reproduction output. Temperature has an influence on all the rates. Salinity influences ingestion. So when salinity is too low, your oyster will refuse to eat. And then uh, whenever there is no food availability and the reserve is depleted, the organism will use energy from the reproduction buffer or even from functional tissue to maintain its vital function. So this is under starvation scenarios. And then whenever the day of spawning is reached, the reproductive output uh, or reproductive energy that is stored will be released in the form of larvae. And a part of this energy is also spent on this experiment. So that model, um, spans all life cycles. So it starts from a fertilized egg, which will lose uh, weight to respiration. Whenever the egg hatches, it will start feeding within the brooding mother. It's released, it's settled, and the end of metamorphosis is reached, and puberty is reached. It will start reproducing, and finally, it will reach the end of its life. So that model has many outputs, which are valuable, such as growth or fitness of the animal, um, different reproductive output um, uh, parameters also things are related to the mass balance so filtration species production species production protein and lipid content of the oyster and everything is uh, so all the fluxes are expressed uh, as a balance so it can be an energy balance in joules but also a mass balance in grams or moles and all the fluxes also have elementary composition so until these days uh, these days, there's more than 250 different model outputs which have to be used for different species. Then what I did is I used that model as a basis and I coupled it with data which is available in the, in the Copernicus database. It's AirSan data, which is spatial data. It has a spatial scale, but also 23 layers into the depth. So you can extract depth data for all the parameters you can think of. What I used was chlorophyll A, salinity, and temperature. I did not consider an effect of SPM on the metabolism. It could be included, but the data about this is very limited, so I didn't include it for now. And then I could also have opted to use remote sensing data, but on European scale, you have certain locations where there's stratification, so interpolation from the surface to the bottom is uh, impossible. And the data that I extracted was from 2010 to 2020, and it was monthly data. And then when I applied the that model to this data, I could make different output maps. So for example, the map that you see here is the minimum fitness that an oyster has over a period of 10 years. So the blue is the areas where your oyster doesn't have any fitness, so it actually died. And the reds uh, are areas where the fitness of your oysters is very high. So the trends that we see is that in the north and the western part, your oysters won't survive. And this is mainly because there's a lack of food due to Atlantic waters coming in. And then there's also the outflows of the outflows of rivers, which uh, have increased salinity and are unsuitable for uh, oyster restoration or oyster aquaculture, whatever you're interested in. 
And then I also consider a threshold 0 0.4 because the results that you see here are results from an average oyster. And then um, because you can also include genetic diversity in, in the model, your average oyster might be stronger than a certain part of the population. And then, for example, if your average oyster has a minimum fitness of 0 0.4 in a certain location, it's still possible that a part of your youth actually dies because they are less, um, yeah, less suitable to your location, for example. When I overlay this with the results of the Olsen map, the Olsen fisheries map, then you can clearly see that the historical reefs are present in locations where oysters have a high fitness. Then I could do the same and generate results related to reproduction. Um, what I did here, or what I plotted here, is the cumulative reproductive output of an adult oyster over a 10 year period. So it's the amount of larvae, uh, so the sum of the amount of larvae released during all the reproductive events in this 10 year period. And you see that the reefs in the southern part of the North Sea and the English Channel are more reproductive. And this is mainly due to temperature. So what, uh, warmer waters with more uh, heat, of course, are more reproductive. And then again, when I overlay these uh, with the historical oyster reef presence, uh, reefs are mainly present where you have a high reproductive output. But there are some examples, for example, the reefs here in the north and one reef here. <clears throat> these are really located in areas that don't really have a, a high reproductive output as modeled by the back model. Then I also started to collect different data sets of different factors, such as the data set about the sediment. Uh, which was available on the AmoNet website. I contained, uh, I extracted sediment type in two five classifications, as called five um, classification system. And it's red is uh, mud, yellow is uh, fine sand, green is coarse sand, and then the blue is rocky or mixed sediment. So this is, yeah, it's quite broad classification. It can be fine tuned, but data is not always covered. There's not always data coverage for all of them. Then there is a few more factors that I collected. For example, bottom oxygen, minimum bottom oxygen, average current, maximum current, depths, and then applied GAMS, uh, generalized additive models to this to find trends. And actually, based on these GAMS and also literature, literature data, I could apply some thresholds to all these factors. And, and from these thresholds, I could build habitat suitability map of uh, this part of Europe. So um, yeah, what you see here, so the blue areas are unsuitable and then the green areas that go to yellow and red are the suitable areas or highly suitable areas in case of the yellow. So please have a look. And if your reef is situated in a location which is not suitable, give me a call or find me in a, in a carpet and complain. And we can have a look at uh, what the situation is in your reef and why it's not suitable according to the model. So it's I think it's valuable so I can fine tune the model a bit more. Um, I also wanted to fine tune the model by including extra factors if I can find, find data sets for these and validate it on a smaller scale. So I wanted to include locations such as the Lynn Fjord, uh, Western Ireland, and some parts of Sweden to apply this model on a smaller scale and see how it performs. Then I also wanted to include uh, larvae arrivals. So this is, for example, data that I received from, from the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences, and it's larvae dispersal data. And the larvae were released from uh, known reefs or locations where oysters are present in uh, the north of France and south of England. <clears throat> what I wanted to do is I wanted to include, include other reefs, for example, in the Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, and the West, uh, Western UK, to also see how the larvae disperse, disperse from these locations. Then I can add this as a factor in the habitat stability index. Then there's also self recruitment data, which was also genera uh, generated by uh, Arbens. And also, these are factors that I would like to include in the habitat stability index to get more uh, precise results. Um, okay, here I'm finished. I hope there will be many questions and uh, people want to evaluate their locations. So feel free to contact me on the email address or uh, ask me questions later. Thanks.
that's a really interesting presentation. Um, the last speaker in this session before we get to the Q&A session is uh, Luca van der Rijn. Um, Luca is uh, um, a marine ecologist specialised in uh, interactions between biota, fluid dynamics and sediment. Uh, she works on integrative projects ranging from ecosystem restoration and environmental uh, management to modelling tools for aquaculture. She focuses on ecosystem function in relation to physical processes and human uses. So over to you, uh, Luca. Hey, Rod. Uh, yeah, this is the EcoFaint project. Um, so uh, this is quite a large uh, public-private uh, uh, collaboration uh, between Wageningen Marine Research, Tiltaris, Bureau Waardenburg, Gemini Wind Farms and SAS Consultancy. And yeah, the aim is of this particular work package is to uh, provide modeling tools for uh, oyster restoration. The team itself is much bigger, but the ones who've been active in this particular work package are Greg Ballas. Um, he was from Deltaris, he shifts it now. My colleague Tim Reimakers, um, and myself, all Deltaris, and Oscar Boss from Wageningen Marine Research. The project as a whole aims to uh, do monitoring of the Gemini uh, oyster pilot site and to develop cost efficient methods. That's a talk that Oscar Boss is given tomorrow. Uh, this presentation is about the understanding and the modeling of abiotic environment. And ultimately, of course, we want to culminate this into advice for restoration, particularly offshore and particularly within wind farms. Uh, offshore is generally a more challenging environment to work in than near shore. Things tend to be rough, uh, things tend to be dangerous sometimes, so there's something you always have to be in, uh, take into account. If you want to use wind farms as a restoration site, which are sometimes very useful sites because they're not fished by bottom trawling, particularly the wind farms themselves, they demand extra assurances uh, that stuff is not going to get lost, stuff is not going to get swept against the turbines. And everything you do offshore is expensive. It requires big material. So numerical models can help you in assessing suitable locations, both for adults and for uh, larval dispersal. Assess suitable timing for deployment and for monitoring and also assess the minimum requirements for stability for equipment. And I'm gonna th go through all of these aspects uh, in the next few minutes. So if you look at habitat suitability for adults, even if you don't go as far as Brecht with the dead modeling, um, looking at bed shear stress, so which areas in the North Sea uh, you have a lot of impact from the force of the, of the water on the bed, so that can be wave action and it can be tidal uh, currents. Um, modeling SPM, uh, sort of the, the fine sediment dynamics in the North Sea. Uh, oysters can generally survive short periods of uh, high SPM concentrations, it, for instance, after a storm. But if it's sustained for a long period of time, that's not so good for them. Bed composition already shown again by, by Brecht. There's still some uncertainty about um, how well oysters are capable of dealing with uh, muddy sites. Um, there, are, there is evidence that they don't deal with it that well at the same time where the old, old large oyster grounds were. It's a fairly muddy site, generally. Food availability, well, this is from data from uh, Emotnet. And last but not least, also very important for oyster suitability is um, whether you are in an area uh, with uh, sand waves, mobile sand waves. There are big areas in, um, in the North Sea, in the southern part of the North Sea, where sand waves occur. That doesn't have to be that bad. Sand waves can be there as long as they don't really walk through your area, if they don't go anywhere. And that's indicated by the asymmetry of sand waves. So particularly areas of the Holland coast are really unsuitable for oyster restoration, oyster restoration because these sand waves are moving through the area and they will swamp you, your, your oyster bed within um, a few years time. Also, larval dispersal, if you start with oyster restoration in the North Sea, that isn't any natural recruitment. So larvae will have to come from the site that you're restoring. That can be done with uh, 
well, similar sort of models as what Brecht showed. These are some um, model results of an older model where um, larvae are released in certain wind, wind farm sites. You see that the, the southern part and the northern part where we released oysters, uh, they're both quite suitable. There's quite a high retention of larvae in that area. Again, if you're in the Holland coast, there is a lot of residual currents and you lose your oyster larvae from your particular site. These sites will never become self-sufficient in terms of larval supply. Now for equipment, um, again, if you're deploying oysters in cages to keep them a bit off the bed, dislodgement of these cages can be problematic. problematic. Um, there are wind farms in suitable areas for oyster restoration, um, but these wind farms, they will demand also extra security against risks of, of uh, these cages colliding, for instance, with turbine poles. And we actually lost some cages in the Gemini area in 2019, despite the fact that we thought the area was suitable. So hydrodynamics for nearly all these factors is really key. Um, we have uh, recently taken into use uh, a new model for the North Sea. Uh, it's called the Dutch Continental Shelf model, but it's um, it's actually modeling quite a large area, the whole the whole of the North Sea plus part of the Atlantic, uh, and it's really state of the art. And it's one of the things it's very good at is. Uh, predicting stratification. The stratification is a process of layers of water with different densities occurring. That's what happens in quite large parts of the North Sea that in summer the water warms up at the top and becomes lighter effectively than at the bottom. But that also means you have different temperatures at the top than at the bottom. Uh, so this model is particularly good at predicting stratification. So, like I said, for larvae, lar the, time, the timing of the release of larvae in the water that occurs at the bed, and that is also very much temperature dependent. Uh, Matthäus et al. Uh, produced a, a predictive system called the temperature sum uh, that should predict the timing of swarming of larvae. The temperature sum is basically the water temperature at day I minus the temperature um, when larvae are viable and are, are capable of swarming, and that is summed and uh, uh, multiplied by the time step. Now, they determined that um, for the North Sea, generally larvae start swarming at a temperature sum between 590 and 660 degrees, um, but this will differ clearly per location. If you use, for instance, our model and you look at the site in the Gemini wind farm, um, this is over 14 years, the different uh, periods uh, where the temperature sum is between 590 and 660. And so the, diff the day in the year differs quite, quite a lot. But this can be used then to, if you have good information about, uh, hydro or, or about um, meteorology uh, and you have a model you can predict any given location effectively what the temperature sum is and it can help you with uh, getting the right timing for monitoring or for deployment. Also for dislodgement we lost one of these cages uh, or two of these cages actually I think in 2019. We did a bit of a hindcast. Greg Ballas devised a model, fairly simple model based on the cage geometry uh, and determined under which hydrodynamic conditions, these things become mobile and start being swept away. Using the previously shown model, uh, looking at the weather conditions in that period where these cages were deployed, we actually found two storm periods where uh, the hydrodynamic conditions exceeded those where the cages became mobile. So um, this is a good uh, learning process using models such as these, okay, this was built on hindsight, but in future, if you have the right sort of model to predict under which conditions the, mo the, the, the cages become mobile and be start being dislodged, and you use um, a, a long-term series of, uh, of model data, you can determine what kind of minimum stability your oyster cages need to have in order to deploy them safely. Now, it is, of course, a lot cheaper to uh, deploy 
loose oysters. And that might be possible in some areas as well. There are definitely some areas in the North Sea that are far too dynamic to deploy loose oysters. But there are areas where you might be able to do that. And in order to determine this, we're also trying to determine mobility factors for the dislodgement of oysters uh, with different uh, weight classes of oysters. Now, oysters um, are actually a lot more difficult to model than uh, a cage which is built up of nice cylinders. So actually this sort of thing you best test in the basin. And that's what um, Tim and Oscar have recently been doing. They've been carrying out tests in one of our uh, big basins with uh, different weight classes of oysters. So the red, the green and the blue, that's the different weight classes. And the stripes, we call them now rugby oysters, they indicate whether that's the top or the bottom of the oyster. And um, filming this in the flume tank and looking at under which conditions these things become mobile and start being dislodged gives you an indication what the forces are to dislodge these. And then if you subsequently use a model, a good model on bed shear stress, you can start, sort out which locations would be suitable to use just deployment of oysters loose just by chucking them overboard or by sort of, uh, yeah, at least placing them at the seabed and which areas are not suitable for that at all. So in conclusion, yeah, your offshore work modeling tools, they can save you money. The modeling themselves, it, it does, it is specialist work. So that costs money as well, but generally not as much as losing cages. Numerical models are very good, but they also need validation. And so part of this can come from physical flume tests. Some of the validation can come from monitoring programs, and sometimes you need targeted uh, measurements. And at the moment with an EcoFriend, we're also not so much recruiting seals, but seeing if we can use data from uh, temperature loggers on tagged seals. And these guys go everywhere. They go into wind, par in, in wind farms. They go everywhere. Use these also for model validation. And that seems to work quite well. Um, to work within wind farms, you do need to f test physically. That's basically a requirement that the wind farm owners have. So that's, yeah, you don't, you don't get around that. Um, one of the things we want to do is do some further work on the larval dispersal. The old data I've shown you um, are simply with ne neutrally buoyant larvae and they're with an older model. The current model we have is much better at the transport near the bed. Uh, to talk to David Smith, um, uh, wind is not included in this model. We can do that, but uh, depths of 20 to 40 meters in the middle of the North Sea, wind is not really a, a very important factor for transport. So in this case, you can ignore it. In other cases, you definitely can't. Uh, and we also would like to include uh, behavior of larvae into the model. So increased sinking behavior. And this clearly requires collaboration between engineers and ecologists. And this photo in, illustrates that quite nicely. My colleague, Kim Tim Raimak, is, is from the hydraulic engineering department in our lab. And he's working together with Oscar Boss from Agony Marine Research. So yeah, thank you very much. That's it. And if there's any questions, quite happy to answer them. And now I would like to give the word to Erwin Kohlen, the director of that program, um, to introduce himself and the program, and um, also to uh, explain why he was so, and still is, so enthusiastic in supporting Noah. Well, uh, thank you, Hein, and I think everything works here. Uh, yeah, and a big thanks to, uh, to you, the whole organizing committee that you are successful in getting a, a digital event where you can virtually walk around, tap each other on the shoulder and uh, have uh, good discussions. Uh, my name is Erwin Kohle. I'm the program director of the Rich North Sea program, which is initiated by two NGOs, Stichting de Noordzee and Stichting Natura Milieu from the Netherlands, and which was funded by the P Dutch Postcode Lottery. What we do is uh, nature enhancement in offshore wind farms. And today I'm also visiting here the uh, offshore wind conference for wind Europe. Uh, and uh, the goal of my being here is to explain to all these offshore wind developers, and this is just one out of six holes, why this flat oyster can be so very important for the existence of offshore wind. Uh, because, well, why offshore wind? We have climate targets, targets. we need a, a transition from uh, fossil to renewable, 
that means electrification and especially for the Netherlands that means uh, offshore wind and offshore wind will no, have a huge claim on space in the Dutch North Sea. Uh, and if you have a claim on, uh, on space, you can't just do that uh, for harvesting green kilowatt hours. You must then think about multi-use. By the way, tomorrow we are giving a, a presentation on behalf of the Rich North Sea also here about multi-use uh, in offshore wind farms and the perspective of nature enhancement in the Dutch part of the North Sea. Uh, but multi-use uh, is, is something that the offshore wind sector needs to take into account, this big offshore wind sector. And the Rich North Sea program is then especially for nature enhancement in offshore wind farms. We want to use these offshore wind farms as a nursery chamber to give a kickstart in a more healthier and more biodiversity in, uh, in the Dutch North Sea. And why is that possible? Well, all these offshore wind turbines are standing on foundations, steel structures, massive structures, which are uh, placed on the seabed with lots of rocks around it. So the sand doesn't flush away and it's all hard substrate. And well, as you all know, you know that all better than I am. I do a uh, hard substrate is a perfect way to attract uh, little species and that attract bigger uh, species again. And then you have, uh, well, very nice biodiversity. Uh, and now why then the flat oyster? Uh, as many of you uh, will know that the flat oyster about hundred years ago was really uh, say 20% of the Dutch part of the North Sea was covered with flat oyster reefs. Uh, so we want to reintroduce uh, or, or use the flat oyster for nature enhancement and offshore wind farms. We are doing a lot of uh, projects uh, with offshore wind uh, project developers. Um, my colleagues from the Rich North Sea team are also in Gathertown. Just give them a tap on the shoulder if you want to uh, know more about it. They're also giving presentations. But we want to use the flat oyster, especially as living reefs, uh, so uh, uh, we can give uh, nature enhancement a little bit of a kickstart in these nursery chambers. Fishing is not allowed, so it's really nice and quiet. Um, what I would like to tell you is, uh, at home I've got this big Lego wind turbine. Uh, and uh, if I have then a dream uh, that Lego turbine is built onshore, in the future we will have a Lego turbine offshore, where you also have the seabed, where you can have little flat oysters, which you can put on the seabed, little fish, so that also nature enhancement below in the water is top of mind of uh, many, many people. And especially the people here behind me, uh, the people from the offshore wind industry, because they need to know that nature enhancement, uh, nature and wind is a winning combination. When I joined the offshore wind sector in 95, uh, the wind industry was at the same position of what uh, the uh, NGOs are now. They uh, talk to each other and now wind and offshore is a perfect combination. I, I foresee the same combination, a winning combination for nature and offshore wind turbines. Uh, it's a winning combination and uh, I'm happy that the Rich North Sea can contribute to that. Also happy that the Rich North Sea can contribute to the NORA program. I wish you really uh, lots of good luck, uh, very nice moments also individually and I hope to be there next year also uh, from uh, the Rich North Sea and then uh, live. Thank you, Ryan, and all the uh, uh, organization committee, and I wish everybody a very successful three-day conference.